Good morning, Lift family. We are so glad you have joined us this morning for worship. We've got Trey Simon in the house to lead us. We are so excited that you are here. Why don't you stand up and sing with us? We can worship our Lord. Hey, Lift Church, are you ready to worship? Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. It looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Feel you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Feel you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Shame at the door, sin ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. I was not the end, the journey's where you are. Never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. Failure's never final when the father's in the world. Failure's never final when the father's in the room. See you clap your hands this morning. The prodigals come home, the helpless find home. Love is on the moon, when the father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the moon, when the father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynical find faith, love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Jericho was a quaking, strongholds now are shaking, love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Come on. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Yeah, I'll search the world. Now 
together I guess you would say so we're just thankful for being here and uh, look forward to what God's going to do I want you this morning just to take a moment and just kind of wave with everybody look at the people around you the, the room looks really good this morning 
And uh, we just want to say thank you for being here. You can be seated if you like for just a few moments. And we have some exciting things coming up. This is actually next weekend begins our Christmas series. And we're excited about that three weeks. And we're going to have a great time together. We've got some special things for you. You do not want to miss if you're watching online, you don't want to miss it. If you're in the room, you want to be here. And uh, it's going to be an exciting week or three weeks of Christmas leading up to our Christmas time. So. Yes, we're super excited. You don't want to miss out. So tell us about what's happening Tuesday. Okay. This Tuesday. This Tuesday is National Giving Tuesday. So as the lift, we are going to give to our Giving Hope. That will be December 18th. So um, if you give $100, that will sponsor one child and give them three amazing gifts. And they'll be able to come here and hear about Jesus. It's going to be great on yeah. the 18th. Yes, yeah. I, I was sitting, I was out in the lobby this morning as we were, some our net first service people were leaving. And someone brought me up a piece of paper that had folded in there $30 from a couple of little girls in the audience this morning or in the church this morning. They wanted to make sure it got to Giving Hope. So on Tuesday, you don't have to just give 100 You can give 50 you can give 25 you can give 10 But it's just a day of giving. It's done all over the world. And uh, we just hope that you'll go. You can go to our webpage, Instagram, whatever, and it'll take you to a place where you can give. I personally going to wait and give mine on, on Tuesday. And our, our goal is $10,000. Now, let me just say this. Last year, we put in a little over twenty. $5,000 for Giving Hope and uh, it was exciting and uh, we did 200 kids 200 kids received Christmas last year and what we're finding this year is going to be a little bit bigger than it was last year and uh, it's just a joy so if you want to work Giving Hope it is on the 18th you can sign out up sign out on yep yeah, sign, sign up, up the yeah in the lobby on the on the kiosk or just see one of our volunteers they'll help you sign up but we need at least 150 to 200 volunteers that day uh, last year we had yes. 450 people in this room or in different places of the building making it happen that included uh, the families so it's a wonderful opportunity to work for two three hours on Saturday and give back and so we need your help there as well as we need it financially so get involved in any way that you possibly yes, can. Yes we're going to transfer from this whole entire building there's an opportunity for everyone to get involved so make sure that you sign up it is a lot of fun. Yes it really is and then um, there's something else I'm supposed to talk about and then you don't remember maybe it's your hat. No, I don't know. No, maybe it wasn't. Uh, we just want to say thank you for your generosity. You give every week, and uh, you're watching online. Maybe you've already given online. Maybe you've given online setting in this room. But in just a few moments, the, the bucket's going to be passed, and uh, we're going to give an opportunity to give here as well. But uh, we're excited about today. We have Mr. Trey Simon back with us today. And we love Trey. He's one of our own up in Detroit, and he travels down here takes time to be with us and I'm so thankful for him and his ministry and how God's using him and uh, you're going to enjoy that today and Lance is ending up our series our Thanksgiving series and you're going to enjoy that as well today thank you so much oh I know what it was if you're a guest oh my goodness yes. welcome tell them what to do we are so glad that you are here if you are here for the first time thank you for joining us we want to make sure that you receive one of our welcome gifts so go out to our lobby and let our guest services team know. You'll fill out a card. We would love to connect with you and just welcome you to our church. Yeah, so, okay. All right, stand up with us. We're going to continue to worship. Uh, let me pray for us, and uh, and we'll just see what God's going to do this morning. You're, you're in for a treat, okay? Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the people that you've sent our way in this room and also online. We're so thankful we have the opportunity to share your love with your people. And Lord, I just pray as we continue to worship this morning, you would just work in our hearts and lives. I pray that you'll move in this room and Lord, in just an incredible way. And people that are watching online, Father, I just pray, Lord, that you'll work in their hearts. And Lord, we look forward to what you're going to do. Thank you for the generosity of your people. Thank you for all that you're doing, Father. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the 
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne Just raise your hands in this moment. Just surrender to him, yielding to him. Father, we just want to touch from you. We want to touch from heaven, Father. We just want to be close to you, close to your heart, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Yeah, I can't get enough. Yes. I can't get enough. You're amazing, love. I can't get yeah, I can't walk away 
song out to him. Sing your song out to him. Your sweetest song. Your sweetest song for your king. Yes, God. Let's pray. Lord, I just I want to lift up the name of Jesus. Such a powerful name. Like just a mere mention of that name. And evil, it trembles. Just the mere mention of your name, Jesus, and darkness starts to hide. Oh, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, that you stepped out of heaven just some 2,000 years ago, and, and you walked among us. And Jesus, you did what no man could do. You paid the penalty for sin. You did it on the cross. You gave us life. And I thank you, Jesus. Oh, I thank you. I pray that every word that has come from our lips, you have received as praise and worship in your ears. Jesus, it's all about you. There is nothing more. It is just you. And, and I, I pray that, that you, would, you would show that, you would reveal that to the people that are watching this service today. Jesus, as we open up your word, it is an incredibly powerful word. It's so amazing how it can look into the depths of our soul. And it, it understands us in ways that we don't understand ourselves. And I pray that as we read your word, that you would transform our life. Speak into us. Make us. 
to your image. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. And somebody's going to celebrate Jesus Christ. Will you do that? Just celebrate Him. Yeah. Man, that's good. I'm, I'm going to let you be seated. And uh, I just, I just got to say welcome. Welcome. To, that's church right there. That is church. Welcome to church. Those of you that are joining us on the other side of a screen, thank you for being a part of church today. I, I hope that you felt welcome and you're just as much a part of us wherever you are watching the service from as those that are here in person. Uh, Trey, I want to say thank you, buddy. I know he's already off stage, but uh, he'll hear me in the back. Trey, thank you for coming and passionately leading us in worship and um, it's going to be a good day. So we're we're in uh, we're in the last the last sermon of a series that we're calling "Give Thanks," which kind of makes sense because this is the the time of the seasons that we're in this this season of giving thanks Thanksgiving, and one of the things that we said last week is that we're to give thanks in in all circumstances, like every circumstance. There's not a circumstance that we're not to give thanks in. And I know for some of us, we can wrestle with that one. Because you might be thinking right now, well, there's a circumstance right now that I, don't, I can't give thanks. There's no thanks to give. No, there's, there's thanks to give. There's always thanks to give. Um, this week, we're going we're gonna to twist it just a little bit. And we're going to go in another direction that's going gonna, gonna to help us to... Um, it's going to help us with this whole idea of giving thanks. But before I can go in that direction, I've got to clear some things up from last Sunday. Last Sunday, I, I used one of the things that I did. I used an illustration about what um, a project around the house that my wife was wanting me to do, which was to hang uh, some mirrors in, in our, our bedroom. And um, some of you, my life group, heard that, and, you know, they're starting to send texts, and I've gotten all kinds of phone calls, and Andrew's gotten all kinds of phone calls and all kinds of texts about mirrors in our bedroom, and I just wanted to clear it up, okay? So uh, if you'll put the picture up on the screen, we, we want to just, we want to help you understand. This is the mirrors that we're talking about that I hung, a lot of picture frame mirrors uh, beside our bed. Now, I, I don't know why, evidently, this is a new thing that you put a mirror behind a lamp. I don't understand, but I'm a man, Okay. But that's, that's what it is. All right? Are we, are we clear? I need to help some of you. We're, we're, we're good, right? Those of you that are watching online, you're thinking, what in the world is he talking about? Go back and watch last Sunday sermon, and then you'll understand. I just got to clear it all up. Some of you, your minds. You're crazy. You're crazy. You know, um, we baptized last Sunday. Yeah, you know, I, I, love, I love to baptize. And sometimes I can get a little excited when we baptize. And uh, one service, I, I baptized this young lady by the name of Caden. Now, those of you that know me, I have a younger daughter named Caden. And so I was telling her, if, if you were here, I was talking about that during the baptism of, of how I love that name. I've got uh, my youngest daughter. Her name is Caden. And so normally, just so you, you understand baptism, whenever I'm baptizing someone, normally after I talk to them for a second, I would ask them, have you placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ? And at that moment, they're going to say to me something like, yes, I have. And so then I will follow that by going, well, based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, and then I will, if it's a, if it's a female, I will say uh, my sister, because they're now my sister in Christ, and if it's a male, if it's a dude, then I will say my brother, if, you know, my brother in Christ. Well, um, last Sunday, instead of saying my sister in Christ, um, I said my daughter. I baptize you, my daughter, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and nobody told me. Nobody even said a word to me about it. It's like, okay, let's just don't tell him. Don't tell him, you know. And, and uh, it's later in the week, like midweek this week, I'm watching the service. I, I asked Noah, I said, hey, let's put together the, the baptisms. And, you know, we'll, we'll throw it out there on social media. And, and we can celebrate life change. 
And, and nobody said a word until I get it on my computer and I start watching it. And I heard those words. I baptized my daughter. You, my daughter, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I, I, I can't put that online. Oh, my goodness. So I just had to clear it up. I know you're, you're probably, I'm not trying to take anyone's daughter. I just, I just messed that one up. And so all this week I have wrestled with some of these mess ups, like, you know, mis, you know, telling an illustration and it being received in a different way than the intended way and, and then, you know, saying the wrong thing during baptism. And I really have, just being honest, I've beat myself up this week over that. I, I've, I thought, well, there's not a pastor in America that said those kinds of stupid things. I'm sure there has been, but at the moment, I can't see one. And, and I, what was I doing? I was doing what so many of us do. I was comparing myself to other pastors, other people. I wonder about you. Like, who, who do you look to to determine how well you're doing? Is it your neighbor? Maybe it's you're, you're driving home from work. It's been a long day. You're driving home. You're turning into your, your neighborhood or your, your, you know, into your house. And you look at your neighbor's house and you're like, man, I like what they've got. Look at their, their yard. It's so green. How do they do that? What do they put on their yard? Like, mine's already turned brown. It's dying out. And theirs is, is alive. And we've got the same grass. We, you know, they've got fescue. I've got fescue. And well, what's the deal here? Is, it, is that you? Maybe for you, it's, it's your best friend's kids. There's something about their kids. They're always so well-behaved. They never have to get on to them. They never have to spank them. They never have to call them down. You, y'all can, you can go to a restaurant, and their kids, they sit at the table with their hands in their laps, and they're so polite, and they say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And your kids, they're not even at the table. They're running through the restaurant. They've gone crazy. And, and, you know, and you're, you're, you're trying to play man-to-man defense. You're, you know, you're one spouse is with one and another is with another. And you're just thinking, wow, why can't my kids be more like their kids? I must be a terrible parent. I, I wonder, who do you look at that determines how well you're doing? Is it your Is it your teammates? Wow, I wish I could be more like them. I wish I could shoot the ball like they shoot the ball. I wish I was as gifted as, as they are. If you're taking notes, I want to give you a key thought for today. It's a key thought that um, has to do with comparison. And here's the key thought. When comparing with someone else begins contentment with yourself will end when you start the moment you start to compare your life with someone else's life there is no way that you're going to live a life of thankfulness you won't be able to do what is God's will for our life which is to give thanks in all circumstances if you're always comparing your life with someone else's because you'll always find someone who's doing better you'll always find something that you want more and so you won't be able to give thanks the way that scripture says to give thanks in fact there's no win in comparison you, you can't win that way And so today this is what we're gonna do we're gonna look at a story in scripture that has a lot to do with comparing. If you have got a Bible, go to 1 Samuel. That's in the Old Testament, okay? 1 Samuel, and we're going to be in chapter 18 today. We, we've, heard, we've heard a portion of this story a lot. Like oftentimes, we're going to talk about Saul, and we're going to talk about David. Oftentimes, we will talk about David, King David, a lot. I've got a lot of sermons about King David. Very seldom do I ever talk about Saul. And I was reading this week about, about Saul and about his life, and I'm like, wow, this is a great story 
on comparison. Now, just to set up the context a little bit, by the time we get to chapter 18, David has defeated Goliath. He, he's killed the giant. The giant is dead. Everyone is celebrating. They're so happy with David. He's come along. King, King Saul, he, is, he loves David. He, he's like, okay, I'm not going to let you go back to your dad. You're going with me. Uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, th this is where the friendship started. This very, very close, tight friendship. A friendship that was so great that, that Jonathan would take off all of his royal uh, things, like his royal robe and his armor and his swords and, and his bows and his belt, and he would give it to David, all because of what had happened. And we pick up the story, and we see in verse 6, as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the woman came out, the, the women came out of all the cities in Israel, singing and dancing, this, and if you've got a Bible, this is an important phrase to underline, to meet King Saul. They weren't coming out to see David, they were coming out to see King Saul with, with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. Now, we don't read anything here that's not common. This would, this would have been a, a, something very common for King Saul. This was a king's life. He, he had fought all these enemies, everyone that he was fighting, on the right or the left. The Bible tells us, Scripture says, he was always victorious. So we don't read anything here that's out of the ordinary. This would have been something that would have happened, a very common thing. They would have come out to see the king. He's on the way. He's passing through. We're, we're going to celebrate him. You, you look at this. And you realize that, that Saul outwardly was a very strong man. Saul outwardly was a leader. He was a warrior. But, but one of the things that you're going to see on the inside, there was a struggle going on. And we're going to see it. It's going to come out as verse 7 says, And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now, this is not going to set well with Saul. Look at verse 8. And Saul was very angry, and, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands? And what more can he have but the kingdom? And then verse 9, which may be, well, it's one of those verses in Scripture that is just, a, it's, a, it's a terrible verse. Like you read this verse, and, and it grieves me to, to read this verse. Verse 9 says, And Saul eyed David from that day on. He eyed him. You know what that means? It means he watched him. He kept his eyes on him. He was comparing his life to David's life. See, where comparison begins, contentment with yourself ends. And Saul becomes a great case study for what comparison does in our life. Saul becomes like a picture of the downward spiral that happens when we begin to compare. And I want you to watch it. If, if you're taking notes, I want you to write some things down. I, I'm, I'm really going to lay out the track that comparison follows when it's in our life. The first thing that we're going to notice here is that comparison starts when we calculate. Now, I'll, I'll explain this to you. There's a lot of calculations going on here. Th this is where the drifting started. This is where the math begins to, to happen in our life. When we start calculating the differences between us and other people. Like we'll, we'll look at someone that we work with and, and we'll, we'll hear, what happened? What, what do you mean? They got a raise? I, I didn't get a raise? We, we start the calculation. Oh, look at them. They, they got a new car? I didn't get a new car. I haven't had a new car in 10 years. Well, why is it that they get a new car, but I don't get a new car? You see how the calculations begin? 
You're looking through social media, you're on Instagram, and you see they're, they're on another vacation. That's like the seventh vacation this year. Do, I mean, do they ever work? And it's, it's, it's only June, and oh, look where they're at. I've always wanted to go there. So we, we start by calculating, and it's what happened with, with Saul. He, he started doing the math. You look in verse 8, it says, uh, he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. He's doing the math. He's running the numbers. He's calculating. Saul, he's adding things up. It's like, where did this, where did this guy come from? I'm the king here. I'm the king. I've been the king for 27 years. Where, where's he coming from? I'm the one that, that have fought all these battles and, and I've won all of these battles. And then here comes David. I mean, he's coming along. He's just a little, just a little boy. He just shows up with this door dash and, and, and now everybody's celebrating him. Do you see it? Comparison. It, it starts when we, when we start to calculate. And when we... When we begin to calculate, let me tell you what to do. It will lead us to speculate. That's number two. If you're taking notes, comparison leads us to speculate. Well, we'll speculate things when we start to compare with other people. We'll, we'll, we'll speculate on things that are not necessarily true. Like, oh, well, they're, they're just trying to take my position. They want my position on the team. And we'll begin to compete with them. Or they want my job, my place in the company. Oh, they're just, they're moving in on my friends. They want to take my friends from me. And we'll start to speculate. And it starts this competition, this, this whole thing where we're comparing ourselves with someone else and We'll believe things that are not necessarily true. That's what happened with Saul. He, he started believing things that, that wasn't necessarily true. In verse 8, we, we, we get an understanding of what he started to speculate on. He says, what more can he have but the kingdom? Now, I'll translate this for you. What, what he's saying is, oh, I guess next they're going to want to make him king. Or... He is going to want to take my throne. He's going to want to become king. He's going to want to take over, which is nothing like that. David had just defeated Goliath. He, 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 you know, he was just coming along with, 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 with Saul. All this stuff started happening, and Saul started speculating. I'll tell you what happens with us is when we start to do that, we'll start to see people as enemies that are not enemies. See, this is what we know about David. We know that, that David was Saul's son-in-law. So he was part of the family. But yet, Saul sees him as an enemy. We know that, that David is, is Saul's son's best friend. We, we, we know that David was placed over Oh, as a bodyguard to Saul, that he was one of the leaders of his troops. And now Saul is beginning to speculate. This guy, David, is, is assigned to his security. And now he's beginning to speculate and, and, to, and to think, well, wow, he's, he's against me. He's trying to take over what I have. See, we'll see someone as enemies who are not necessarily enemies. You read this, and it really wasn't David's fault, and it wasn't necessarily Saul's fault that all this happened. It was an external fault. See, you, re you read this story, and it was an external voice that started this entire thing. And how many of you know that external voices will cause you to lose your mind? Like, you, you will go crazy when someone starts to, to compare you with someone else. You, you will go crazy. We, we just came out of Thanksgiving. Some, some of you ladies, like, you spent 
hours in the kitchen working on all those casseroles and, and fixing turkey and, and dressing and, and I mean all this amazing food. Imagine what, it would, what it's like to sit down at, at your Thanksgiving meal to ask, oh, how's everything taste? You know, how's the, uh, how's the pineapple casserole? And, and your husband says, well, it's, it's not like mom's. What do you mean it's not like mom's? Well, you know, honey, it's just a, it's a little dry. What do you mean it's not like mom's? You, you, you see, can you imagine just how you would begin to feel? Oh, how's, how's, the, how's the, the five flavored pound cake? Well, it doesn't taste like granny's. Well, just go get granny to fix your cake for you. You know, I mean, you just, you just, you'll lose your mind on that. When people start to compare you with someone else, oh, why can't you just be more like your sister? Your, your sister, oh, she's, she's always, she's much neater. She keeps her room in order. She makes up her bed. She makes good decisions. And you're just like, be more like my sister. You know, you walk by her room and everything is, her bed's made. There's no clothes on the floor and, and she's sitting on her bed doing her homework. <laughs> Makes you sick, right? Saul is in the same situation. He is being compared to someone else. It's what comparison will do. It will lead us to spiral out of control. It starts when we calculate. It will lead us to speculate, which will eventually cause us to inflate. It really inflate. No, number three, if you're taking notes, comparison inflates our hate. Like, why are you hating on people? I can tell you, most likely the reason why you're hating on people is because of this whole thing of comparison. Like it puffs us up. It makes us angry. You, you look at Saul, and verse 8 says it. And Saul was very angry. Translate that back in the original Hebrew. That's what it means. He's very angry. He, was, he lost his mind over this thing. He, he, this saying displeased him. Like the more we compare ourselves with someone else, the more discontentment will grow in our life, the more anger and frustration that will grow. I mean, think about Saul for just a moment. What do we know about him? We know that he was the first king of Israel. We know that he was anointed and appointed by God. We, we know that, that he, he looked like a king. Scripture says that he stood a head above all the rest. Scripture says that he was a good-looking man. Guys, imagine if the Bible said that about you. He's a good-looking man. Can't nobody go against that. Like, guess the mate, this is, this is Saul. He's a good-looking man. And yet here he's got this little 15-year-old dude that rolls up on the scene, and it's causing him to lose his mind. That's what comparison will do in our life. It just begins to inflate and to the point that it explodes. There, there are some of you, and you're here today, or you're watching on the other side of a screen, and you have your eyes on someone so much that you can't stand them. Instead of being happy for them, you'll, you just get angry with them. It'll destroy you. There, there's no win in comparison. I, I can prove it to you. Verse 12, Saul says, the scripture says that Saul was afraid of David. Now remember, he was celebrating David just a few verses ago. Now he's afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. His life, his family, his kingdom, his rule was all spiraling out of control. 
When comparison with someone else begins, contentment with yourself will end. Saul began to eye David. Like he put his eyes on him. And for the rest of his life, that's who he had his eyes on was David. I read that this week and I'm thinking, okay, well, where did, there's got to be a start for this. Like how do we deal with this? How, how, do, we, how, does, how do we work this into our, our lives? I've read it. We've, we've hit it a couple of times, but maybe you missed it, like I did so many times. I, I, I think what I've done is I've found where it all started. I want to see if you see it, too. In verse 8, I'll read it one more time. Scripture says, And Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and what are those next two words? And to me, they have ascribed thousands. To me. To me. That is the problem. Me. You know how we get to the point in our lives where we begin to calculate that leads us to speculate that will eventually cause us to inflate? I'll show you. It's called me. We, we put the me glasses on. Like everything that we see in life, we see through these lenses. And I need you to understand that when you put the me glasses on, there's probably nothing more in life that blinds you than these right here. There's a lot of us that we're walking around with these me glasses like we have this me mentality, this me attitude. Everything is about me. And when you wear these me glasses, you can't see in front of you. you. You don't know what's going on around you. But these me glasses, everything, we make it all, every single thing becomes about me. And this is how you look. Some of you right now, this is how you look. Aren't you blessed to come to church today? For me to show you, this is how you look. We have these me glasses. Like every single thing is about me. Like when you wear the me glasses, you get offended about things that you should never get offended about. When, when you wear the me glasses, you, you get upset about things that you never should get upset about. Like, did you, did you see what she was wearing? I've got that same outfit. Like, she knows that I have the same outfit. She's copying me. You begin to compare yourself. Did you, did you see that post? That post that they made? It's about me. They're calling me out. I, I can't believe that they would do that. Like the me glasses. Every single thing is about me. Every conversation is about me. You're talking to someone. They just, they just bought a new Dodge Ram truck. You know, the, the one that the, the TRX, the one with the 702 horsepower Hemi engine in it. And man, they're just ecstatic about it. And, and, and you're, you're like, man, I, yeah, that sounds good. And then all of a sudden, you can't keep it to you. Now, yeah, I remember when I bought my first truck. You turn everything to you. Someone's dog passes away. Had him for 12 years. Yeah. I remember when I lost my dog. Everything is about me. We need to get our eyes 
off of me. We need to get our eyes off of other people, off of the Davids in this world. We need to get our eyes off of them, and we need to get our eyes on Jesus. Our eyes are to be fixed on Jesus. Let me tell you what Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, verse 1 says, And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We are all, if you didn't know it, you do now. We are all in this race. God has placed us in this race. He set a race before us. And in order for us to run with endurance, there is a place that our eyes have to be fixed. And he says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Not the person on our left, not the person on our right, not our best friend, not the Davids of the world, not ourselves, but we keep our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. We all have a race to run And in order for us to run, we've got a lane that we run in. But let me tell you something. You can't run in your lane when you've got the me glasses on because you can't see anything. You can't stay in your lane. You'll you'll, you'll, you'll be all over the place. This past week, we we went to the, uh, the Simpsons tree, Christmas tree lot down off King Street or on King Street. My wife and I and my, my father, we, we drove down there because my daughter was working down there. And, and listen, Christmas, you want to start Christmas off right. You just go to the Christmas tree light. It's just something about it. You go at nighttime when it's really cold and it just feels Christmassy. And so we're on our way there. We get off of Highway 74. We get on to Char- Charlottetown Avenue. And I, I've never seen this before, but we're on Charlottetown Avenue. And we get right even with CPCC. And in my lane... I'm not kidding you. This is not a story, a preacher story that I made up to prove a point. But in my lane, my lane, coming towards me is a truck in my lane driving towards me while I'm driving towards it. Now imagine, I don't know if you know the area that I'm talking about, but that person shouldn't be in my lane. There is a clear divider between my lane and their lane, but they're in my lane. And there's, I'm starting to look around. I've got to take evasive action. What am I going to do? You know, I've got people on my right. I've got people behind me. We're driving, I'm moving along pretty good. What am I going to do? Because this person is in a truck. It's a lady and, and she's driving towards us and she gets as close to this front row right here to us before she stops and then she starts to look and figure out what she's going to do she turns and she jumps the median and she gets back into her lane and continues now how many of you know that couldn't have ended well if she wouldn't have gotten out of my lane and gotten back into her lane There are some of you, and you can't live your life, you can't run your race because you're in someone else's lane. You gotta get out of their lane. You gotta stop looking at someone else's race to determine how well you're doing. You gotta get your eyes on Jesus and take the me glasses off. As long as we wear these me glasses, life is about me. And everyone you see will be a threat to you. And you'll constantly calculate. You'll begin to speculate things about them that aren't true that will eventually cause you to inflate, explode, to get angry. How do you know? How do you know if you have the me glasses on? I want to give you just a few signs really quickly. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Um, I'll do this with questions. How do you know if you have the me glasses on? Do you you find it hard to, to compliment other people 
I mean, really, do you, do you find it hard to compliment, to say nice things to other people, about other people? It might be that you're wearing the me glasses. Do you have a hard time celebrating other people's successes without talking about your own? If that's you, you're, you're wearing the me glasses. Do you secretly celebrate when other people fail? When someone doesn't make the team, when they don't become the captain, when they don't pass the test, when they don't get the position, do you secretly inside celebrate? <laughs> if, that, if that's you, you're wearing the me glasses. It's easy to put the me glasses on. The only way to take them off is to take your eyes off the Davids and look at Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of your faith. You want to stop the comparison in your life because it leads to nowhere. It's destructive. You want to stop the downward spiral. Set your eyes on Jesus. Set them on Jesus. Will you bow your heads, close your eyes. Normally at this moment, I would, I would ask you maybe some questions like, how many of you are, can see yourself with the me glasses on? I'm just going to let God speak to you. Some of you, you've got people in your life that you're competing with, that you're constantly comparing yourself with. And you're looking to them to determine how well you're doing. And God's going to speak to your heart today and say, oh, you need to get your eyes off of them. And you need to put your eyes on Jesus. Whatever he says, you listen to him. You listen to him. Now, there's another group of people that I, I want to talk to for just a moment because you're the, you're the ones that, that's on my heart. Like, you're the ones that have been in my mind today and it's those people who you're in the wrong lane and you're going the wrong way in life and if you keep going that direction the direction that you're going right now somebody is going to get hurt and, and I came here today just to tell you that you need to get in the lane that God created for you some of you need to get out of the lane that you're in, headed the direction that you're going, and you need to go God's way, and that way is putting your eyes on Jesus. And the only way to put your eyes on Jesus is to give him your heart. So the question is, have you given him your heart in your life? Some of you might be here today, and you might say, uh, Pastor, what, tell me what that means. Let me tell you, very quickly, this is the gospel. We are all sinners, and the wages of sin is death for all of us. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's grace, I mean, of God, God's uh, perfect will for our life. That's why he gave his son Jesus. Jesus left heaven, came to earth, lived a sinless, perfect life. He took our sin upon him on a cross because no one else could. Only he could do that. He did that so that we might give our lives to him. He could save us, transform us, change the direction of our life, get us out of the wrong lane into the right lane. I just wonder, has that ever happened to you? Have you ever placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? If you haven't, 
why don't you do it right now? With your heads bowed in this, this posture of humility, and your hearts are open to God, why don't you cry out to Jesus, that very powerful name, and just ask him to save you and to forgive you of your sins. Right now, right where you are, wherever you're watching, just say, Jesus, please save me. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I believe, tell him this, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you gave your life for me. And in return, I want to give my life to you. Tell him, Jesus, I surrender. I surrender my life to you today. Please come in and save me and forgive me of my sins. Ask him. Ask him. Listen, friend, if, if that was your conversation, your prayer, Jesus Christ just stepped out of heaven and right into your heart. You can now run your race with your eyes on him. If you're watching on the other side of a screen, I want to encourage you to do something. Right now, our hosts are placing links in the chat sections, in the rooms. In the, and uh, if you're an online church, you can, right now, you can click that says, Today, I place my faith in Jesus. You got to tell somebody. We want to walk through this journey, this life that we have. We want to walk with you. We want to help you understand the, the decision that you've made. So please, please tell somebody. Those of you that are here in person, I want to ask you, did you pray that prayer? Did you place your faith and trust in Jesus? If you did, this is what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you just to simply lift your hand. Just lift it up. That's right. Hold it up. Hold it up. Hands are going up. Please hold them up. I just want to pray for you for just a moment. Hold them up. Hold them up. Hold them up. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. God, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you that in this place we can close out a, a series designed around this, this, this idea of saying thank you. We can close out by saying thank you that you saved people. Thank you that today people have crossed that line of faith and they've placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. God, I, I just want to say thank you because I'm picturing that woman that was driving that truck in the, long, the wrong lane, endangering her life and other people's lives. I'm picturing that there have been many people today that have switched lanes. Like they've gotten in that lane that you want them in. They're now able to run the race that you designed for them. And they can place their eyes on Jesus. They can take their eyes off of anyone else and put them on him. And I want to say thank you. As we leave this place, I pray that we'll leave our me glasses right here. We won't carry them out. We'll keep them off. Lord, life is about Jesus. So help us to set our eyes on him. I pray this in the mighty, precious, and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said amen. And we celebrated life change today. Thank you so much. Clay. I just want to say thank you for those who are watching online. Thank you for being a part of our service today. Thank each and every one of you being here. If you don't mind, I need to take just about two minutes of your time. I want to share just a quick story that happened this morning. As I was standing out in the welcome area, I welcomed one of our members this morning, and I knew that he was had something important in his life last week that we were praying about. And uh, I said, how did it go? And I actually said what it was. And he said, you have five minutes after the service today. And I said, yes, I do. And uh, so at the end of the service, I was out at the door, and uh, as I was at the door, I saw him coming out. I said, let's walk into this room here. And he went into that room there with tears in his eyes, and I said, and what I'd ask him about, how did that job interview go for, for, for a promotion that he had? And he looked at me, and he said, I didn't get it. And tears flowing down his eyes, and he said, I didn't get that promotion. And he said, it was about me. Then he said, two days later, 
he lost his dog and he started feeling sorry for himself and he said it was about me and I was sitting there this morning he had no idea the message that was going to be preached and I'm just going to say this to you God is at work And there's nothing like being in a group of people and a group of believers and hearing God's word and understanding that God is working. And we never know the day that we come what God has to say to us. And I want to encourage you and myself as well as we walk into this building, in this time of worship, in this time of a message that we open our hearts, God has something to say to me and to you And he wants to talk to us. He wants to help us. He left here this morning. He he told me, he said, man, it was just all about me. And he said, today the message was about me. And uh, he was so relieved. And I said to him, what God didn't open up now, he will open up later. And I truly believe that. And I just want to encourage you with that this morning. And also, I have someone, I'm going to ask Jason to come down. Come on down here, Jason. Uh, I'm going to ask some of our men of our church to come down as well. We're going to pray for Jason this morning. Uh, Jason's one of our guys that, uh, as you know, is the lift. We have a great ministry in uh, Kenya. And Jason's uh, actually going to slip out for a week uh, without some of our people. And uh, he's going to slip over to Kenya, and he'll be there next Saturday morning. That's their Saturday night. They're leaving on Friday. And... Uh, we always pray for our people as, they, as God sends them out. And uh, today we're going to pray for Jason for his protection and that God would just bless him. And uh, we'll be excited about what he finds out while he's over there and how God uses him. So uh, let's just pray together. If you will, if you'll stand with me as we pray for Jason. If you want to reach your hand out, feel free to do so if you'd like. Lord, I just thank you for this day. Thank you for how you speak to each and every one of us. And Father, I just lift up Jason to you today. I pray as he travels that you will keep him safe. I pray as he ministers and God, you use him in Kenya uh, in a week or so, Lord, that you will bless him in so many ways. I pray that you'll protect him from anything that will hinder him in any way during his trip. I pray for the the team that he's going with and being a part of. I pray that you'll use him with those people as well. And we just lift him up and pray your protection, Father, upon him and the team there. And God, it used them in an incredible way. I pray that you'll bring him back safely. We love you, Father. We put our faith and our trust in you. Be with his family as, as he is gone. And God, I pray that you'll bless them. We love you and thank you for all that you're doing. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.